Morning, church. It's good to see you all this morning. Royston, shout out to Royston and all of our online friends. Hope you're ready. Hope you're ready for a good one this morning. Uh, we're going to spend some time in Genesis chapter 21, but before we do, let me bless you. Let me bless you this morning. I bless you now in the name of Jesus that you would know Jesus more wonderfully this morning. I bless you to receive healing if you need healing in your body, in your mind, in your emotions, in your spirit today. I bless you to receive whatever guidance from God you need, whatever help from God you need immediately. I bless you to have the courage and capacity to flourish and prevail over whatever challenges you're facing in your life right now. And I bless you to feel hope and joy and love and peace and freedom, whatever's going on. I bless you with that. In the name of Jesus, may it be. Amen. All right, so we are in a study on Abraham, who is God's friend. We've been in this for quite some time. And so I think I just need to let us all know where we're, what's important. You know, one of the beginnings of a TV show or something like that, previously on Rehope, you know, uh, what, what we need to know going into today. Abraham's family, for about 14 years to 17 years, depending on which part of this chapter we're in, has been a mess behind closed doors. And we've talked about that before. We talked about how Sarah's, uh, Abraham's wife Sarah wasn't able to have any children, and once she got way too old for any hope of that, at about the age of 75, she proposed surrogacy, a very common and not strange practice back then, where Abraham... Um, would have a baby with Hagar, and then Sarah would adopt her as her own. In fact, this is what we read, oh man, months ago in in Genesis chapter 16. We saw this, it said, So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. That That was that. Two verses later, but when Hagar knew she was pregnant... She began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. And then two verses after that, then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. It's a little bit of background. Now, Hagar comes back, but for the last 14 years or so, there has been a lot of tension in in this household. Uh, It seems that there's anger going on. There's a lot of toxic home environment stuff going on. And since then, over these 14 years, Ishmael has been born. Ishmael is Abraham's oldest son, his firstborn, uh, that he had with Hagar there. And Abraham loves Ishmael. In fact, at one point, Abraham pleads that Ishmael be the recipient of all of the promises uh, that were coming to him and through his family line. So Abraham loves Ishmael, and so we just, we just remember that Ishmael was the expected one to be the inheritor. He is the firstborn. The ancient rites, including you know, Deuteronomy chapter 21, is going to talk about how the firstborn, even if it's not from your favorite person, uh, is to be the inheritor uh, and get the rights of the firstborn. So you, you would assume that Ishmael has expected for his life and up into these teenage years to be the prime inheritor of this Abraham clan, you know, 318 warriors, maybe about a thousand people in total, uh, that he would be having this large, huge inheritance. Well, that's the background of this story. Today we're picking up in Genesis chapter 21, and there's four people at the heart of this story. And we're going to kind of go through the story, and we're going to look at each one of these four peoples and the challenges that they're facing, that maybe the pains that they've experienced in their lives, and then the lessons that we can learn from them. That's where we're going. Ready to dive in? All right. Uh, Genesis chapter 21. Here's how it begins. The Lord kept his word. I mean, amen, right? Awesome. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and gave, she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God had said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days later, eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. 
Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. I notice she doesn't comment about her age being 90 in Abraham's old age. Man, after, what, a, what a great start, right? After 25 years of waiting, they, they've, they've had this promise of, of descendants for 25 years, and they've navigated all the ups and downs in life, and uh, times of struggling to believe, struggling to believe that God's promise would be true for them, and specifically through Sarah, but finally now God has kept his promise, and, and that's just after feeling all hope was lost there with that promise. This is an amazing moment for Sarah. She's happy. She's full of joy. She's, she's celebrating. And, and I'm not going to linger here, but I mean, do you know what this feels like to have one of those 25-year prayer requests? Uh, maybe not many of us, but like one of those prayer requests that just, we've been praying for it forever and ever, and it just seemed like it was never going to happen. And then it does. And, and just to celebrate, God has been so good, and, and wow, I mean, God's, God, God's goodness to, to Sarah. I, I know how brutal it can be waiting for prayers to be answered, for, for waiting for God to keep his, his promises. I mean, it can be really painful. And some people, in the waiting, they can get mad at God and turn really toxic at God and, and, and bitter, losing patience and, and all that stuff. But I, I love this story. Because after all of the time, after all natural hope and expectation is, is long past, God shows his goodness to Sarah. She receives it. She is, she's happy. She's laughing. And Isaac is born. Great start. So then, then now what happens with Sarah here? Well, we keep reading. And we get to verse 8, which says, When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant Hagar, making fun of her son Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. Yikes. Okay, let's talk about Sarah for a moment. Sarah is very understandably hurt. She's had a lot of pain. Understandable. Understandable. She has been angry for, it seems, about 17 years at this point. And maybe at Hagar directly, at, at Ishmael, just because of his connection there. But Hagar has intentionally at times, maybe also just unintentionally, just being who she is, uh, be, just existing in the home, uh, has been a source of pain and, and agitation and anger for Sarah. Sarah's husband loves Ishmael, Hagar's son. And, and, and that's, that's a source. Uh, it's an issue there. That she knows, she sees how Abraham feels about his, his son Ishmael. She's seen that for years. And so here we find Sarah raging, <laughs> full of anger at least, full of anger, demanding, demanding her husband get Hagar and her son, which is also Abraham's son, out of their lives forever. Demanding that with zero inheritance. And I, I find Sarah's story just like so sad, but also I see it in our, in our city. But it's, just, it's so sad. Like, God has been so good to her. And sure, there was long years of her life where she didn't have everything that she was hoping for or everything that God wanted, but, but God was still being good to her even though she hadn't get all, got all of these requests answered. He had been protecting her, and she didn't even maybe perceive it all at times. He had had a huge blessing over her life and her home, and, and she didn't maybe perceive it all the time because, again, that one thing wasn't happening. And, and yet God had been good to her for the last 90 years, but instead of being happy... In light of what God has done for her, that, that those years and years of bitterness just haven't dissipated. She, she's bitter, or bitter, angry, demanding her husband to get rid of the son. And, and I just got to say, guys, God does not want you to live bitter. God does not want you to live angry. 
In fact, direct quote, Ephesians chapter 4 in the New Testament, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, it goes on and on. Direct quote, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger. Don't let it be a part of your life. If it's there, get rid of it. Sarah, what a miserable life that, that she has been in. Such bitterness and anger, again, for, for 17 years. God wants us to forgive everyone of everything. To forgive everyone of everything. And I, I want to just make sure you hear that. That is the call for us who follow Jesus. To forgive everyone who has sinned against us everything. Who are the Hagars in your life? Who are those that when you think about them, you get angry? You, you, that you're angry at, that you're bitter maybe towards, that you, that you respond with um, strong, a negative emotion. Maybe a former friend, maybe a, maybe a, a, a grown child or a, a grown daughter, son, a friend who maybe hurt you, I don't know. Who, who's the Hagar in, in your life? And, I, and I'm sure you have very understandable reasons for those feelings of, of anger. Uh, uh, maybe of, of rage or whatever, of, of just being upset. I'm sure you can easily justify feeling that way, but it's time. It's time to get rid of Ephesians 4. It's time to get rid of the anger. It's time to get rid of the rage. It's time to get rid of the bitterness. It's time to forgive, and it's time to put anger away let go of it and release these people to god and to to forgive them it's it's time to get anger out of your life now some of you have natural anger and yet that natural anger has opened a door for a spirit of anger to also jump in there and and it's become something that you're you're like oh i just can't easily put this anger away i i I just i'm just uh, impacted by it where there's a combination of natural anger and a spirit of anger and for you you're you're gonna have to deal with like getting you know renouncing rejecting anger in your life and just saying spirit of anger or spirit of rage or spirit of bitterness or spirit of hate get out of my life in the name of jesus and, and and just and just go for it but it's time to get rid of that stuff How do we move forward? Well, we remember that God has been good to us even if not all our prayers have been answered. Even if not all our dreams have come true. That God has been good to you. And and again, you might be like, how has God been good to to me? Well, if you've given your life to Jesus, He has forgiven you. That's good. He has forgiven you of everything, the the insults that that you have intentionally or unintentionally thrown his way, um, just every way that you've hurt, it, hurt him and insulted him, he's forgiven you. And again, God makes it so clear in the New Testament. Jesus says it so, so clearly that um, it's a big deal to God that the people that he forgives, forgives others. I mean, you can, there's parables about that. There's teachings about that with prayer. Just, if you've been forgiven, the call is to, to, to forgive as well. Everyone, everything. You've been forgiven, everything. I, and I, I, I keep mentioning this, but I'm overwhelmed by how important it is to God that we love one another. Jesus says it, but also to love our enemies and, and even that one person. Th- this call to, to love, and, and we just underestimate maybe how significant and how important it is to God for us to actually do this. And I told you, in, in both of my long fasts, God confronted me about certain r- broken relationships that he wanted me to address and he wanted me to deal with. And in my first fast a while ago, like, God brought a, about the, the one person who was, brought the most hurt into my life. And he's like, I want you to address this. And I did. I did. So I, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about in, in this sort of thing. But God calls his people to trust him and to walk this path of forgiving those who have sinned against us because he wants his family to live in unity. And it doesn't want anger and bitterness to be a part of our situation. So anyway, so the faith challenge from Sarah is, who am I most angry with? Who, am I, who do I need to forgive so that I, I don't hold on to anger in my heart? And if anger is stuck in my heart, then I need to get it out. Maybe rebuking that anger, maybe just sending it out in the name of Jesus. 
We're happy to help you with that, by the way, around here. We have prayer ministry. We can help you with that. There's times you can go to the bottom of the website. We have times of an hour of prayer, maybe after services. You're like, man, anger is just stuck in my life. Uh, let's, let's deal with that. We're here for you. All right, so that was Sarah. Let's look at Abraham. And we're going to look at him in the next couple of verses here. So all that happened, we just read, and this upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their sons, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. Okay, Abraham. The word here is upset. He's upset. It's upset Abraham. Abraham is told, don't be upset. Uh, Abraham is, is understandably upset. He, this is his son. We're talking about this is this was his firstborn son, and Sarah is demanding that that he, Abraham sends him away with no inheritance at all, zero. Like all the levels of wrong and, and unfair here. And I mean, you just think about it. Abraham is so rich and so powerful. He could have sent them away with some donkeys, um, some wagons. It wouldn't have even made a dent, right? Like it wouldn't even made just just a couple animals and, and donkeys just cars just to get them going with, with some supplies, get them so they can get somewhere. Instead, they just strap on a water bottle on Hagar and, and some food that she can carry. Like that's, that is all, that is the sum total of the inheritance that Ishmael will receive. I mean, wow. And it doesn't get them very far. It just, they're, they just wander in the, in the same, same area. I... I it just feels so wrong. And, and yet, thinking about Abraham for a moment, not, not Hagar yet, this is the moment where Abraham is sending his 17-year-old. It's time for him to, to go. And, and he's releasing his son into life, and he's releasing his son with very little, like, like embarrassingly little. And, and he is, he's upset. He's not happy about this. But yeah, it, even in the best of times, it can be hard to release our teens our grown children, into the world, especially from Christian families. And yet, Abraham is called to trust God with his son. His son does not have enough for life. He is not ready to make it very far. And Abraham's first faith test is releasing his son and, and letting God watch over him, protect him, guide him, take care of him. And Abraham, again, he knows he doesn't have enough, just a little bit of water, a little bit of food. Even at the best of times, it, it can be hard for us to release our sons. I remember reading a, um, or, or children, I remember reading a biography by John Patton, and he's a Scottish missionary to the Hebrides, and just amazing, amazing man of God, but I was probably most captured by the moment he leaves home. And, and he raised, raised in this Christian home, you know, one of those homes where the dad has this prayer room and everybody hears the loud wails, please have mercy on John, my son, you know, that sort of thing. And yeah, like, you know, like one of those kind of uh, old homes. And so he, he, but the time came where John was moving to Glasgow to go to the University of Glasgow, every parent's dread. And, and, as, and they're walking, I don't know, south of Kilmarnock, because they, they stopped at Kilmarnock on the way, but as they're walking towards, towards the city here, where he's going to go to university, where, where he's going to leave his son to, the, to this unknown, uh, they're walking along, and again, it's a difficult moment. It says this in the book, when the time, they, they got part way, and then they were going to go different ways, and the dad was going to return, and John was going to continue on to Glasgow. When it was time to depart, again, this is the moment where he's releasing his son into the unknown. His father struggled to speak. His mouth kept moving, but no words would come out until finally all he could say was, God bless you, my son. May your father's God prosper you and keep you from all evil. Unable to say any more with all the tears, 
They embraced and parted. I kind of imagine something like that with Abraham and Ishmael. Just comes a point. May, may your father's God protect you and keep you from, from evil. I, I mean, I, I get that, and I know some of you have, are parents, and you've, you've had that moment in your life where you, you've released uh, some children, and you've, you've, you've let them go, and they've left your household, and, they, and, they, and they've gone off. Uh, it can be hard to entrust your adult children to God for His protective, protection and guidance. And so I encourage you, if you've got that scenario, you pray for your kids, pray for your teens, pray for your young adult kids, and like Abraham, though, choose to, entrust, choose to trust the Lord with them. We will see that God will take care of Ishmael, even though he doesn't have enough when he leaves home, that God will direct his path. Ishmael's father's God is going to take it from here. It's going to be all right. So anyway, so that was Abraham. And then let's see what happens with Hagar. I'm going to back up one verse just to hear the Hagar story. So, so Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water was gone... She put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about 100 yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. Okay, so in this story, you can see Hagar has reached the end. Like, the, the, she's given up hope. She has nothing left. She has, she has now left her 17-year-old son to die. About, about 100 yards away, she is feeling absolutely hopeless. She has lost everything. She has long expected at least her son to inherit something. But now all that dream is shattered, and she's got nothing, no food, no water, no strength. She has no strength. Ishmael has no strength. I don't know if you've ever been at a place like this, like Hagar. Like, so hopeless. Feeling like so completely out of strength. Feeling so much like... Like, you've just given up, just given up in, in life, seeing no hope going forward, you just feel like a wreck. Here, Ishmael has given up on life, and he's crying. God hears that. Hagar has given up on life, is crying, both expecting to die. This has got to be one of the most hopeless and miserable situations. I can't even fully imagine it. Maybe some of you can, though. The good news is, God hears God sees tears. I, I'm sure that Hagar believes that God has stopped caring about her because she's so miserable and can't see any way forward. I believe that she, I would guess that Hagar believes that God just isn't paying attention to her or has just abandoned her. But he hasn't. Here's what we read about God in Psalm 56. He says, God, you keep track of all my sorrows or wanderings. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book, each one of my tears. God keeps track of all your sorrow and, and all your tears. Each moment of pain, each, each moment of grief, every moment of feeling totally lost and totally hopeless, you're not ignored by God. He sees you. He sees you, he, he's recording your tears, says the Psalms. For some of you, he has a large ledger, and that's a great thing. He's paying attention. But God sees, and he, and he sees Hagar when she, she reaches her end. And, and if you feel hopeless, and if you feel like giving up, like God sees you too. God sees you too. And, and what does he do with Hagar at her lowest? Well, he gives her a promise about her son and his future, and he opens her eyes to see what she could not see, but what was right in front of her. 
It's, it's amazing how God had been directing her to a well that she couldn't see. She was wandering, but it just so happens that she's right there at a well, even though she doesn't know it. So often we feel like God's abandoned us while He's directing us. There was hope there. There was water there. She just couldn't see it until God opened her eyes. Friends, for those of you who have decided to trust Jesus with your lives, trust Jesus. Like, trust, trust Jesus, even on the days that your life's come crashing down. Even, even when it seems like all hope is lost, when there's just tears everywhere, there's despair, when you feel like just giving up, when you feel like there is no hope, I say there's always hope. Whether you can see it or not, there's always hope. God sees you, you can trust Him, and so just call out to Him, God, open my eyes, so that I can see what I need to see. Open my eyes to see. I've experienced this myself. I remember walking around this city for a long period of time. I could not see what I needed to see. I could not see in any way forward. And I was praying and praying and praying and, and going to prayer walk and prayer walk and prayer walk. And, and then one day, I, I'm there on the same prayer walk. I've wait, prayed for months and months and months along the same route. And I'm like, God, open my eyes. And literally right in front of me was the answer. And we started the church there. But like I couldn't see it. I was walking by it every day. I couldn't see it until God opened my eyes to see it. It was right there. And he can do that for me. He did that for Hagar. He can do that for you. There's always hope, whether you can see it or not. That's the Hagar challenge for us. Even when we can't see any hope, God's paying attention. And he, he can be leading us, even if we're not perceiving it. Just the last two verses here, it says... And God was with the boy. As he grew up in the wilderness, he became a skillful archer. And he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. Okay, I just want to mention things from Ishmael's perspective briefly. Ishmael, think about him. He grew up a major source of conflict in his home. He wa it wasn't his fault, but he was a source of major conflict. Sarah didn't want him in the home. Sarah didn't like him at all. Now, there's been, now he's been sent away with basically nothing from his father Abraham, unfairly, as unfair as it's possible to be. This is so wrong. It seems so unfair. Zero inheritance. His father has so much. Just robbed. Robbed. You can talk about Ishmael. You can talk about his father issues. You can talk about his, his family issues. You can talk about his unwanted issues. You can talk about his rejection issues, his toxic home environment upbringing, the anger in his home between, between all the people treated unfairly, not his fault. What do you do if that's your story? Well... When it comes to Ishmael, his, his past may have been horrible, but his future is guided and blessed by God. He leaves that home, and God goes with him and, and leads and directs his step. He, he has a rough time, but God continues to be with him as promised, and, and he's going to end up being blessed and become a, a great nation, even though he has an awful and unfair start, really an evil upbringing. The challenges for the Ishmael types is whatever the past, don't let it define you. Don't let your past wreck your future. You, we forgive, we rightly grieve, we work through healing processes, we get the help that we need, but we don't get, we're not to get stuck in just being uh, so upset about the wrongs of our past that it robs us of the joys of our, our future. If you have a little bit of Ishmael in your story, I encourage you to learn from this moment and, and take some warning from Sarah here as well. Don't let your past define you. Or rob you of the hope and joy of your potential future. Your past does not determine your future. Your God does. Your past does not determine your future. Your God determines your future. So God promised to make Ishmael great, even though his growing up years were, were awful in so many ways. That was the promise to Ishmael. You... If you believe in Jesus, 
have vastly, vastly, vastly greater promises than Ishmael ever had. Vastly greater promises over your life. And I encourage you then to walk the path of Jesus, which means forgiving. Forgiving your parents and your siblings and the extended people in your friendship, whatever, in, their, in your past. Find healing for the wounds in your past. I'm not minimizing every, anything at all. I'm just, I'm just encouraging you, whatever your story, to walk the path of Jesus. Go to God who cares about this and who is sorrowful about the, the, the environment that you were a part of, uh, the evil environment you were a part of. And then let God lead you into his future for you. The legacy that he will have for you if you will follow him and if you will trust him, if you will trust him with the past and if you will trust him with your future. In my family ancestry and, and probably many of yours as well, there are, there are specific people in my past who were raised in evil environments and then they chose to make the change for the next generation. And it's had a multi-generation impact. And, and if you are like an Ishmael, you were raised in an evil environment, make the change for the future generations. You can set a new course, a new beginning as you work with Jesus on your past and as you forge a new future with him. Here's the, here's the challenges for today. Challenge number one, um, there's just looking at which of these people seem to most resonate with you. If Sarah was, resonate, was resonating with you, forgive who you need to forgive so that anger loses its grip on it in your life. We're going to deal with anger. That's what, that's what you're going to want to do. Deal with anger. Get rid of it. Abraham, pray for and entrust to God those whom you need to entrust. Whether it's children or just people, friends that have left or people you're worried about that aren't under your domain right now. Hagar, never give up hope, praying God will open your eyes to see your way forward. Maybe your prayer is, I, I can see no way forward. God, open my eyes. The Ishmaels, forgive and release the pains of your past while trusting God with your future. We're going to do um, a prayer time now. And there's going to be two parts to it. One of them is a quiet part, and one of them is an optional response time. All of these are optional. Um, the quiet part is, I, is, God, I choose to forgive this person. And don't name them out loud, especially if they're sitting next to you. <laughs> right? But, you know, like, this person's hurt me, and, and, and you know, and I, and I have anger there. Um, we're going we're gonna, to, I choose to forgive. And then, second prayer is quiet as well. I choose to entrust this person to you, God. This person, this friend or this person that I'm worried about out there, I, I choose to entrust you. And then there's three optional prayers. And, again, I don't expect all three. All three of these are, or any, any of them to affect everybody. But these three kinds of prayers are just more effective out loud. And so I encourage you, even if you're not really loud about it, just to, to, to say these out loud because these are prayers that are effective out loud. Number one, Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see my way forward. If you're just like feeling stuck or you feel like I don't know, open my eyes to see my way forward. Second prayer, um, it's you modify it to your situation I'm going to be saying, spirit of anger, get out of my life in the name of Jesus. You can say, anger, get out of my life. You can say, spirit of rage, get out of my life. You can say, spirit of hate, get out of my life. I'm going to say, spirit of anger, get out of my life in the name of Jesus. You do you, if that, if that seems appropriate. And then thirdly, Jesus, no matter what my life looks like today, I trust you with my future. I trust you with my future. Why don't you stand with me? Okay. Holy Spirit, come. Now, first we're going to give space to those who are going to be praying the prayer, I choose to forgive this person. Let's go ahead and just pray that prayer. Jesus, I choose to forgive this person. Second prayer for some of you is, I choose to entrust 
this person to you, God? That's leave, leaving my domain or that's left my domain? I choose to entrust this, these people to you. Now, I know that these are rushed. You can go back this afternoon and continue to work through this yourselves uh, more and more. Very simple prayers. The third one, this one works, just works better out loud. If this is you, and I, you know, I don't know, maybe it's 20% or 25% of us, but um, I'll say the prayer. You can repeat it back, and I'll just say it a few times, and if it's you, you can join me, or, or then, then we'll go to the next one. Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see my way forward. Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see my way forward. Holy Spirit, open my eyes so I can see my way forward. Holy Spirit, open my eyes so that I can see my way forward. And, and now connected to, to anger. Again, you can continue to do that more at home later. Uh, spirit of anger, get out of my life in the name of Jesus. Spirit of anger, get out of my life in the name of Jesus. Spirit of anger, get out of my life in the name of Jesus. Spirit of anger, get out of my life in the name of Jesus. And then finally, Jesus, no matter what my life looks like today, I trust you with my future. Jesus, no matter what my life looks like today, I trust you with my future. Jesus, no matter what my life looks like today, I will trust you with my future. Spirit of living God, fall fresh on all of us. You see our, our journeys. You see exactly where we're at. You see our tears. You see our encouragements. You see our hope. You see, our, uh, just, you see all the things. Lord Jesus, lead us clearly. Lead us forward. Let your favor wash on all of us. Set us free from, from anger and, and bitterness and, and, and hate and, and rage and all that stuff in the name of Jesus. And set us free. We may walk with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As Laura comes up, I want to just say that if you want more prayer on anger specifically, um, again, we have prayer ministry time, but we also have time where we can pray for you for a, an extended period of time. If this has been a part of your life for a long time. Um, I encourage you to go to the bottom of the website, the West End website, and there's a place for after-service prayer, which is about an hour or something like that. We would love to really pray with you to see real freedom for you in, this, in the areas of anger.